tenderness is moving. You refresh my soul with words of pristine water that bathe and make me whole. Your holiness is burning through my very soul. Your words consume like fire. I'm pure sovereign majesty I'm captured in the passion of the holy king and I've been reconciled to the son of peace I belong to you you belong to me your authority is comfort it brings me to my knees a noble god of justice you give mercy's peace forgiveness is humbling it makes my life bow beneath the yoke of friendship We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, oh spirits come make us humble, we turn our eyes from evil things, oh Lord we cast down our idols, give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not souls to another. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob, oh God, let us be generation that seeks, that seeks your face, O God of Jacob, O God of Jacob. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. Spirits come make us humble. 
Give me eyes to see more of who you are. And may what I behold still my anxious heart. And take what I have known and break it all apart. And you, my God, are greater still. And no sky contains no doubt restrains all you are the greatness of our God I spend my life to know and I am far from close to all you are the greatness of our God Give me grace to see beyond this moment here. To believe that there is nothing left to fear. And that you alone are high above it all. And you, my God, are great. I 
We know that you are a great God. You are a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of might and power. Send your spirit upon us today. Empower us right here at First Reformed Church. We thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings that you continue to pour upon, uh, upon us. Even in times of distress and hard times, yet you are always there. And uh, Father in heaven, we just give you all the praise. So be with us as the service continues to unfold. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And um, is there someone that's doing a children's sermon this morning? We are trying to figure that out. Okay. Nope. Okay. It said it in the bulletin, but we'll do that. Um, and with that... I'm going to read our scripture lesson this morning from the book of Job, the book of Job. I'll be reading uh, from the first chapter from the, uh, that book and uh, the first 11 verses. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and he had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to his face. May the Lord add his blessing to his word. Today I am beginning a six-part series of sermons on the book of Job. I'm sure that some of you, or maybe more than some of you, might be thinking, 
Haven't we heard enough about suffering during this past year? And that is a good question to ask. But the fact is that the final chapter of Job, when we get to that, is more filled with joy and hope and love of an awesome God than perhaps any other chapter or chapters in the Bible except for the final chapters of the Gospels that tell the story of the resurrection of Jesus, the Son of God. And with that, I want to begin by asking you a few questions. But don't raise your hands to them. Just let me ask them. Just ponder them in your heart. So first, in the last few days, or weeks, or months, or in recent years, have you lost a loved one, either a spouse, or parent, or grandparent, or brother, or sister, or child, an uncle or aunt, a relative or close friend? Next, have you lost a job or an opportunity for one that you thought you were going to get? And if not, have you had some other kind of major disappointment in your life and in your career life? Have you or your loved ones faced or are facing now a serious illness? Are there some other hard circumstances that are happening in your life? These are just a few questions about the many kinds of suffering and sadness and disappointment that people experience on the journey of life in this world. And the story of Job can speak to us in this series, perhaps in different ways than what they have before. The story begins with these words. In the land of Uz, there lived a man named Job. The land of Uz is believed to be a desert land east of Palestine. So it reaches beyond borders and boundaries, which makes this story a universal one. Next, it's a timeless story, for there has always been suffering in this world since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And we live in the reality of times of suffering in our own modern day world as well. So it's a universal story and a timeless one, but at its heart, the story of Job is a personal one because of all of the things that happened in his days on earth. The story begins not about all that Job would lose, but instead about the life and abundance from which he had been so blessed. First, he had great fortune, including 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and 7,000 sheep. Now that is sheer crazy. Sheep and sheer. Uh, okay. <clears throat> I didn't think you'd probably get that. So, so first, great fortune. Next, he had great, a great family, including his wife and several sons and three daughters. The sons took turns preparing feasts and invited their sisters to eat with them. And for you sons who have sisters, you might want to consider doing that sometime. Or maybe not, but anyway. A great fortune. A great family. Next, Job had great fame. In verse 3, it says that he was the greatest man among all the people on earth. He lived on the world stage like some of the superstars of our time. So family, fortune, fame, 
But greater than all of that, Job had great faith. In the Good News Bible, it says that Job worshiped God and was faithful to him. He was careful not to do anything evil. But as the story goes on, evil comes to Job in the person of the greatest evil doer of all. The Bible says that Satan was so sure that he would destroy Job's way of life and his life itself that God said to him, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. Satan used four tactics to try to destroy Job. First, he acted swiftly. For all of the destruction that Satan brought upon Job happened in a single day. Last Sunday, I mentioned that at the start of the pandemic, everything at Emmanuel Church, where I was at, would change in just one week from what it was the week before. For Job, everything would change in one day. So first, swiftly. Next, Satan acted with severity. For everything that was part of Job's life, including his flocks and herds and land and house, and most of all his children, were taken away. When all of these terrible things fell short of Job being totally destroyed, the Lord relented, relented to Satan's request to strike Job's flesh and bones. So now he would be afflicted with painful sores from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. The Bible says that Job took a piece of broken pottery to scrape himself with it while he sat amongst the ashes. To read this story from long ago is in some small degree, small degree, what is happening in our world today. Not just because of COVID, but other heartache and pain as well. Last year at the end of May, we all heard the news, of course, of the death of George Floyd. This news not only spread throughout the country, but to other nations of the world as well. And for me and our family to live slightly more than 15 minutes away, at least in mild traffic, which there never is, but if there was, from where this took place made it seem even more tragic than it already was. For this was the epicenter of what was the biggest news story of that time, not only in this country, but in other countries of the world. And that brings us to some other things. A story that's so many ways like other stories in the Bible, but it goes even beyond that. For Job was not like Isaiah or Jeremiah. He was not a prophet. He was not a priest. He was not part of the royalty or kingship of that time. Yet this story has been read and told from age to age. For it is a story that reminds us that in the divine plans of God, restoration can and does come in the midst of the most tragic times of life. And thank the Lord it does. For even without a worldwide pandemic, there is an average of 7,521 deaths in the United States of America every single day. That's a death every 12 seconds, 365 days of the year. But that's not the whole story. For beyond physical death, there are countless people who are dying in their heart and their soul 
from sorrow and remorse and depression and despair, and the list goes on. Next Sunday, in part two of the story, we will look at everything that Job lost. A little more of that. Today we looked at all the things that he had. And how loss can be such a part of life in this world. And yet, even in the loss, there can still be gain. And as a prelude to that message, I want to go back to something I shared with you in my inaugural message or sermon as your interim pastor one week ago. I mentioned that it was 41 years ago to the day, June 20, 1980, that I was ordained in my home church, Emanuel Reformed in Morrison, Illinois. That night I preached my first very first sermon as an ordained pastor at the Sunday night evening service. And even though it was a very hot day and night and there was no air conditioning in the church and there had already been two services that day, I thought there still might be a fairly good crowd in the sanctuary for the evening service as I preached my first sermon as an ordained pastor. But I think that might have been one of the smallest evening crowds of the summer. My text was from Psalm 137, verse 4, which says, How do you sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? I thought I would jazz up the title for this message. So the title I gave it was, Now They Call Me Pastor, So What? The next day, before I left back for Holland, Michigan, my mother said to me, as only she could say to me, I really liked your message last night, but not so much the title. I tried to explain why I chose it, but it, that didn't help too much. So 40 years later, July 20, 2020, in my home church, I preached from that same text again. But this time the title from the, uh, was from the verse, How Do You Sing the Lord's Song in a Foreign Land? I'm sure my mother would have appreciated that. <clears throat> On that Sunday, June 20, 2020, I thought to myself how blessed I was to be celebrating my 40th anniversary of ministry and including in my home church, even though because of the pandemic, it was almost a near empty sanctuary, kind of like it was 40 years before. <laughs> After the service was over, the vice president came up to me and he said, Al, I have to talk to you about something. Immediately, I'm thinking there must be another COVID issue to sort out because it seemed like there always were. As I'm walking back to the back door of the church with the vice president, there's this whole line of cars with people waving at me and dropping off cards in a basket honoring my 40 years of ministry. This caught me so much by surprise. And there were some tears shed that day. And it made, me so, made it so clear to me that even in some of the hardest seasons of life, Yet, God is so good. He's good to me. He's good to you. And he's good to the church, the body of Christ. And we will see the goodness of the Lord unfold right here as our time together goes on. 
I'd like you to stand with me right now, and we will just sing a cappella before I offer prayer, a song that you know, just the chorus, God is so good. Could you do that? Thank you. <laughs> God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you for all of the goodness that you continue to give us in our daily life. All of the goodness, Lord, that you provide for your church. There are so many different ways that God, that you are so good. And now I pray, Lord, that you will continue to go with us in this journey that we are on here at uh, First Reformed in Baldwin. I pray, Lord, that we will see signs of the Spirit at work. I pray, Father, that we'll see the growth of the church. I pray, Father, that we will see unity within the church. And Lord, we know that you will lead us by the hand all the way through. And so I just lift up all of that to you today. I pray for those, Lord, that are suffering in one way or another. I pray that you will bless them in this time, that you will heal them, that you will watch over them, and that you will give them calm, and that you will give them peace. And the loved ones of those that are suffering, Father, just be very close and near to their side as well. So be with us. The service goes on and this day goes on. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we'll sing. <clears throat> Glory 
I love that song. Thank you so much. And you're good. Man, she, you know, when I was ending that sermon and she came up with, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> Amen.